if you really put your head towards something like it'll happen, you know what I mean? It'll work out if you truly mm-hmm. just grind and, and like throw all your eggs in one basket. I, I really do. Especially if it's like something you're directly passionate. About. Like we said earlier, it's really though, if you just put your eggs in one basket, like you're bound to like have a nice omelet somewhere along the line. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Welcome back to Where Are All My Friends. Damn it, I'm excited about this episode. It is with Brad Fry, who is the band Camino's tour manager. And shout out to our mutual friend Nick for connecting us. But before this, we did not know each other. And I realized that I really hadn't had a lot of tour managers, if any, on the podcast, which is insane because I got my start in music as a tour manager. And talking to him and hearing his story of how he got into it and what he's learned from it and his view on touring was amazing. We also talk a lot about how somebody who's interested can get into touring. So, not only like a fun, rad, natural conversation, but also a very helpful one with a lot of insight and value. The last thing that I have to say is he also has a brand called All Is Well, and I'm timing the release of this episode around the release of a drop of his. So when this is coming out, there will be a drop of his coming out right around the same time, and we're gonna do a giveaway with one of those items. So if you're listening to this right now, head over to the Instagram, I'll link it and follow it, and then share this episode on socials and tag us, and we'll pick somebody who shares and we'll give them a piece from that drop. So thank you for listening, keep an eye out for that, and enjoy. Where are all my friends? Brad Fry, and I have the feeling that this is gonna be a really fun one for a couple reasons. Uh, one, we have like a circle of mutual friends, like one degree of separation away. Uh, massive shout out to Nick for putting us in touch, but I'm really excited to hear your story. Uh, tour managing band Camino, doing your own clothing line. I feel like there's a lot of really cool things that you're up to. And I just think that there's going to be some real fun bits in this. So thank you for joining. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. So I said it super briefly, but for a listener who doesn't know who you are, just a quick explanation of who you are and what you do. Cool. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bradley Fry. Um, I live down in Nashville, Tennessee, originally from Detroit, Michigan. I currently am the full time tour manager for the band Camino. Um, I also do a small bit of like e commerce management um, for like artists doing merchandising. And I also, in lieu of doing that, um, during pandemic started my own like online retail shop so kind of kind of all over the place honestly dabbling around but my main thing is i tour manage the band camino they all kind of communicate with the, uh, each other and they all kind of cross over in a cool way um and it's also nice man like for both of us it's the morning we're both sipping on some coffee yeah. just hanging out and I don't know, man, like I I just feel certain times like with this podcast, I really like to make it a utility and to like provide value. But I was thinking about this and very briefly saying it right before we started recording. But I don't think I've had a proper tour manager on the show. And that's crazy to me because that was my OG start in music. And I think that there's going to be a lot of really fun parallels to talk about because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but both of us almost accidentally got into it and then found it to be extremely fulfilling yeah dude it was it was definitely like a stumble into the role for me i was in a band like most of us were at some point probably and then my band kind of like started to fall apart and i just knew other people that were doing bigger stuff and i was doing the common thing of like working in retail and i was like i can sell shirts over a counter i could probably sell shirts on the road so i toured as like a merch guy for two or three years in like the the funky festival market um and then once i kind of like got my bearings and that uh started reaching out to like bands that were more genre specific to what i was interested in and just kind of domino snowball effect like toured with one band met another band toured with them i mean you know how it goes but yeah eventually just kind of like graduated into tour management and that's what i've been doing for the past like six years wow yo okay so other funny parallel that is an interesting thing with tour managers that i've noticed is i feel like you have two starts to becoming a tour manager (laughs) and they're very different lanes and both tms are equally as good and respected but you can be the starting as merch guy tm or you can be the starting as front of house 
TM. Yeah, yeah, dude. It's both right. Like, it's both those like two very important roles that like as soon as unless you're like super passionate about front of house, which mad respect to anybody that has those kind of production shops and stuff like that. But yeah, if you're like a 50 50, just kind of like, I know business, I know the world, I know production kind of thing. It's just like, you kind of want to continue to step up into that role where like, you're just overseeing things, you know, again, no shade to front of house people, but it's just like, I feel like the merch background is super valuable because it's like, if you can't handle numbers, then like you have no business being a tour manager. Right. And it's like, it's very Absolutely. important to be able to like conceptualize the, the the financials side of things. Yeah. Well, it's such an interesting role because it's one of the most necessary roles on a tour. It's, it's the, the glue that holds it all together. But I think to be a great TM, you really need to understand how every facet of tour works. Yeah. You need to understand what all of the crew is doing, what all of the band is doing, and what everybody needs. So if you understand the merch side, again, you very much understand the numbers. You understand how to report numbers, how to look at numbers, how to project, how to just do general business and commerce. Yeah. And that is massively important. But then the other side is, and you kind of touched on it because you were in a band, but the other side of being a TM is like, ultimately, you're making sure that a band sounds good and feels good every night. Mm -hmm. So they put on the best performance. And if a band sounds bad, they're going to hate it. Like, yeah. there's nothing worse than like not being able to hear yourself on stage or sounding bad over the PA, anything like that. So that's why I think it's such an interesting role is you have to understand that whole picture to make sure that the whole crew is equipped to do what they need to do so everything keeps going. So, yeah, which is especially like a, a, a vision that like it's tough to grasp. Like it's like not a lot of people understand it. You know, it took it took my parents even this is such a common cliche thing in the touring world. Like it took my parents and like family members or anybody for that matter that's like not in the music industry so long to understand what exactly I was doing as a tour manager. Whereas like I think about if I had stayed a merch manager and like I had mad pictures on my Instagram of me just vending and being around t-shirts the whole time. They'd be like, Oh yeah, he sells t-shirts on tour. Or like if I was at a console, yep. every picture or something like that, they'd be like, Oh, yep. he does the audio. But it's just like, so many people are like, what exactly do you do? Like you, you write the contracts. And I'm like, no, I'm not a booking agent. I don't, <laughs> I don't manage the yeah. band. I'm like kind of right in between the two of them. So yeah. yeah, it is. It's a really interesting role to explain to people who don't get it because oh, yeah. it's like for a second, you're like, wait, so what do you do? And you're like everything but nothing. <laughs> and like no day is the same. Like you never know. Like you're there to f to solve every problem. Yeah. You're there to make chaos normal. Like every day, every venue is going to be a little bit different. You're going to have all these new unique problems. So it's like as long as the show goes perfect, your job is done. And some days that's real easy. And other days you're literally pulling skills out of a hat that you didn't know you had, solving problems that you didn't know existed, yeah. fixing trailers and buses yeah. and anything, like whatever it takes to keep the show going. So it's a very interesting role to define. Yeah, man. Thank you so for recognizing I guess, that. <laughs> oh my God, absolutely. I mean, like that was my OG start as well. So I, I feel it. I really do. And the larger, I think some roles get easier as the band grows. You know, like if you're a tech and you're on a, an arena tour, I don't want to say that it's like a walk in the park, but I mean, like, you know, you have a, tons of room to set up. You've got a good professional staff. You have like a lot of resources to yeah. make your job easier. Whereas if you're a tech on a club tour in a van, you're probably having to like set up in the back in like maybe an alley or something, you yeah. know, like there's a lot of like weird variables and Sometimes jobs are easier at a higher level, but I think as a TM, as it continues to grow, you have more and more logistics and the stakes are higher. So it's like, totally. it's really a behind the scenes job that deserves all of the respect. <laughs> but before we get deeper in the weeds with that, because there is a lot that I want to talk about mm -hmm. there. And I think that like, because I think people listening to this could learn a lot. And for me and yourself, I think we both kind of realized like, oh shit, this is actually a really fulfilling, cool career. But it wasn't until later. So if we can shine light on that, awesome. But I'm actually really interested in you because I feel like you have this cool story. You have some really cool interests and you have a pretty rad general mentality on things. So like, what are your early days? You said you're from Detroit. Like, 
did you find music early? Like, what were you into? How did you get to now? Yeah, um, I like definitely found music very early. Um, just kind of dove into like skate punk culture at a pretty young age. I, I tell a lot of people, not a lot of people, this is what I tell. Like, I literally found the Green Day Dookie CD and I was like, Holy this shit. fucking rips. I want to do everything that is involved with this, you know? And so just kind of became this little hard nosed punk from the suburbs. And, uh, it's funny. I like grew up playing guitar. My, my uncle was like a huge Hendrix fan and he has like a studio in his basement. He's a dentist, but he's always been like a huge guitar nerd. And so it was like, you know, Christmas holidays or Christmas dinners, whatever holiday dinners, I would just like hole up in his basement, just playing guitar for hours on end while everybody else is, upstairs doing whatever and so yeah just kind of like gained this huge passion for like rock and roll and specifically guitar and going to shows once i became of age and all that kind of stuff but i never played in a band until after college so went to college got an undergrad degree for clinical exercise science and i was on my Whoa. way to uh chiropractic school actually and I was like, no shit. Yeah, dude, it's crazy. It's it's honestly so wild. Like I have two older brothers that are in the medical field. And I was like, very much so just kind of, I don't want to say like, in the blueprint, but very much so just kind of like following in the footsteps of like what I knew was the safe route in life and, and that kind of thing. And which is not totally. a bad thing to do. Like I'm, you know, I advocate being passionate and like taking risks. But at the same time, it's like, yo, like, if you want to go be a chiropractor and make 150 grand, 100 grand a year, like, you're going to have a nice life. Like it's sick, but, um, yeah, don't force being like, if you're not passionate about something yeah. and like, you're just like, yeah, cool. Like here's a safe route with something that I could do that would be very acceptable. Yeah. Like run it. Exactly. Something that I think about <laughs> that's so like out of the blue, but I think that people joining the military when they don't want to, oh, like, when they don't know what they want to do, isn't like, that's such an <sighs> interesting, like, because that's a check and that's education. Mm -hmm. But like, I don't know, man. It, it's, it's so, there's so many routes of like that. Like it's like, it's a safe kind of figure it route. out. Thing. And if you need to, like, by all means, like the military be can become like a safe haven for somebody that needs it, like for sure. But if it's not like, you know, there's, there's the difference of the people that like being in the army is like in their genealogy versus somebody yeah. that is like, I don't have shit to do after high school. I guess I'll join the army. And it's just like, that is such a risk if you don't know what you're getting into. But at the same time, it's yeah. like it can shape you for into a really great thing, you know, and, and yeah. into a great well, it's like, lifestyle or whatever. But it can yeah. also fucking ruin you. Good Lord. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It, that's that's just that's one of those ones where I've been like, that's an untraditional but safe mold. I remember one friend's brother did it. And like learned about like rockets and engineering and yeah. stuff. And I was like, oh, I didn't expect that. Yeah. And he has like a fucking sick career and a pension and all yeah. that. But like, anyway, There's, that's a sidebar. Yeah, right. I was on my way to Cairo school and I was like writing this letter of acceptance of like why I wanted to be a chiropractor for the rest of my life. And I just like <laughs> couldn't finish the letter. Like I realized that I was just like lying to myself and I just like couldn't muster Holy up fuck. the honesty to like finish this letter and, and just go off and ship out to oregon to be a chiropractor and so i like called my dad and i was like yo i uh i don't think i'm gonna go to cairo school anymore this is literally like my final week of my last year of college and i like and he's like what are you gonna do and i was like i think i just get, i'm gonna try and do the music thing like literally those were my words i was like i'm gonna try and do this music thing like i just i just need to do this music thing i had no idea what it what exactly it was like i had the desire to be on stage and like be in a and then I just knew like from just kind of going to shows and starting to meet people in the industry that like touring was something I wanted to do, but it was never yeah, the yeah. goal of like, I want to be the best tour manager in the world, which is like a goal right, now, but, right. but it was never like it, that. Was, there was never like a specific goal to it, but I just knew that like, all right, I got these guitars. Let's start with that. And so. Well, what's interesting there though, is like you didn't have the traditional path of like some people feel that like they get dookie or they get that album that changes them and it's all in and college isn't even a fucking option. Yeah, like they're dude. like, I don't care. I'll drop out of high school. Yeah. I'm going on tour. Yeah. So it's interesting that you like found that and it, it resonated so heavily with you. 
but you still did do a bit of the formal education. And then at that point in your life where it was like that far along that you're like, no, 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 it's the music thing. I find that very interesting. Yeah. I think like, I think I just like have a great respect for, you know, education. And I think it's a, yeah. you know, I mean, looking back on it or seeing other people's stories, it is like a formal education can be something that is like demeaning and disruptive towards your passion for sure. But at the end of the day, I don't think there's, there's not much that can go wrong with receiving a formal education and it's something to fall back on. And even while I was yeah. doing it, it wasn't necessarily a fallback plan. It was just like, I'm going to go do this thing. I know like to become an adult or like a successful adult that like having a degree will be helpful. So let me just go get this. Yeah. And like, it's not that I wasn't passionate about athletic training and physical therapy and stuff like that. Like I was at the end of the day, man, like I look at, I look back on it and I'm like, dude, I just went to school for five years to learn how to live as long as possible. I literally just learned how to like be healthy and take care of yourself. You know what I mean? And like, Yo, at the end of the day, fuck. I'm like stoked on that too. Like to have that, that, and I was like an athlete in college too. So it was just, it all kind of like, I was still following like this path that I did have, yeah. but yeah, I kind of just yeah. snapped back to not snap back to, but snapped into this reality that was like, nah, man, like. I love music and I love that culture and I love being around it in it. And I want to try and be yeah. as close to it as possible. And here we are like jumping around, jumping around the world and, and doing arena shows. Holy and shit, you know? shit. Yeah. Well, I love hearing stories like that too, because I think that that moment is so fucking scary. Like it is so yeah, fucking scary yeah. to be honest with yourself and be like, Oh shit, I guess I'm going to chase this passion instead of the safe route. And a huge part of this podcast is I love to share stories of people who have taken that leap and done it and succeeded because there is so much blind faith that comes with that to get there. It's insane. Yeah. So you make that leap. What happens next? Like what's so like, all right, not going yeah. to chiropractic, like you're not doing that route. Yeah. Uh, so where my, are you in the world? Like what's your next move? Yeah. So I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And. Yep. I had like six or five months left in my lease downtown. So my first like job out of college, just like a little short term thing until my lease end was I worked in a hardwood flooring company with uh, a college That's friend's cool. father. I was like, hey, I, I'm going to be here for a couple months and just like don't want to go home yet. Can I pick up some work? And so we were like tripping back and forth to Chicago and, and laying a hardwood flooring and like these giant like Lake Michigan mansions and stuff. And so started doing that initially, moved home, got a job at a skate shop, started playing a bunch more guitar and just trying to like, just trying to write music and mess around with people around town and the local scene that like I knew were doing it. And so I got picked up yeah. by this one band that was a kid from high school um, that had been doing it since high school. And like, Lo and behold, they needed a guitarist. So I joined that band. This band was called Drawn to Fury. And I played with them for like, I don't know, six, nine months, less than a year kind of thing. And yeah. um, in working in the skate shop where literally that was that was just my hub, dude. I worked at 12 Oaks Mall yep. and was just like, hey, like, I, this is so funny, man. I was just cleaning out my like closet the other day and I found all the old show flyers that I used to like pass out over the skate counter. But I, I, I like yes. lived at this skate shop and met so many freaking people through it. One of those people is my boy Carter Jones, who ended up, uh, him and I ended up starting a band together. So we started this band and we had our own thing and we did it for like four or five years. Um, and then it kind of wow. started to like, uh, like fizzle out and we all kind of just started going in different ways. My bassist started touring as a front of house guy. I started touring as a merch guy and our drummer went to college and Carter was in Chicago and all this stuff. But, um, yeah, yeah, I was like doing shows with them and then, oh, this is, yeah, this is kind of like how it transitions. There is this band called Gates. I don't know if you've ever heard of Gates. They're from New Jersey. They were an early pure noise post rock band. Um, but the vocalist okay. from Gates, Kevin Dye is the older brother of my best friend. Sorry. That's like a crazy network there. <laughs> I'm following. I'm following. But, you. um, you know, as soon as I started playing shows, I was just like sending him demos and all this kind of stuff because he was like the closest person that I knew that was doing anything yeah. in a larger capacity. And at the time, they were like yep. internationally touring and stuff. And I was like, yo, like, 
tell me everything you know and da 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 and yeah. whatever, whatever. It's also there's a moment where like when you know the the one band that got signed or has yeah. a deal on a label that you would fuck with, like all of a sudden, like you're just like, whoa, like if this person I know did it, then like yeah. maybe I can. And like, yeah. how do I like, how do I tap them and exactly. learn what they know? Or like, how, what was the formula? What did you do? Exactly. Like, yeah. And so I hit him up and I, you know, we, we would correspond whenever he was in town. And eventually he was like, yeah, man, if you ever want to go on tour, let me know. And I was like, okay, sure. I'm still kind of doing this, this thing. So I still want to be able to like do my band. And then I was out at a festival with another local band that had like a local time slot on this, this Michigan festival. And they just like took me as like a crew guy or whatever. I, I went for a free ticket so I could go watch boxing and Andrew WK. Let's be real. Um, Fuck yeah. yeah. And uh, I like walked in and this guy was like setting up the, the merch tent for the festival. And I like went to go drop off Narcos merch and I was like, hey, man, here's like our merch for the day. And he was like, cool, thanks. And like, he was like, kind of up to his years in it at the point. And it was like two hours before doors. And I was like, hey, well, like, I don't really have anything to do. Like, if you need help, let me like, let me know. I can help you do something. I'm just kind of farting around until doors. He's like, no, nah, man, it's all good. I go away. I come back like an hour and a half later. And he's got like 40 boxes of Andrew WK merch. Like, the tent's not up yet. And I'm like, do you need some help? And he's like, yeah, honestly, if you just want to start counting these boxes, like, that would be a huge help. So long story short, I end up like selling merch with him for the whole day. Um, and he's like, if you want to yeah. do this, like I can help, I can probably get you paid. And I was like, yeah, like I said, I sell shirts over the counter. I can sell shirts in a tent, whatever. And, um, there it is. I, I get like my first paycheck for like selling merch. We're connecting, we're this, we're that. And he's like, Hey man, like actually I tour manage this band, Joe Hurtler and the Rainbow Seekers. We're doing our second full us tour like next month. And we don't have a merch guy. Do you want to go? And I was like, yeah, whatever. And so I literally like quit <laughs> my job of four years where I like had benefits and had security. At your skate shop? Yeah, yeah. I just like quit the job and went on tour and literally like quit the job, went on tour three weeks later and Holy trotted shit. around the country with Joe Hurtler and the Rainbow Seekers. And I toured with them for like a minute, dude. I toured with them for a very long time, like four or five years. Um, the first two Whoa. years as their merch guy and then the latter three years as their tour manager and like main dude. And then, uh, um, and then, yeah, it was like after like three or four years of touring with them, probably let's just say three years of touring with them was when I was like, Hey, like kind of good at this. My band is kind of falling apart. Let me like tap back into like these other bands or these other people that I've met along the way. And I just started freelance, did Joe Hurtler. And then I finally got to go out with Gates and then did a tour with oh, Gates. Crazy. And on that tour, I met this band Microwave. And then I went out with Microwave oh, cool. for like two or three years. And then from Microwave, I met the band Camino um, and started with the band Camino in 2018 and uh had some other like random ones in there went out with covet for a tour and yeah just like started freelancing after that it was just like i i guess i do this now <laughs> like i can't believe we had never met dude like the things that you just said there like everything is like one point of separation away dude, so it would nuts. not surprise me if we've been in the same room together that kind of like that's, that's honestly just how it is you know what i mean but honestly we'll have to obviously but you said something there god that was so fucking important. Yeah. You had you, like you you did the thing where you committed to doing the music thing. Mm -hmm. You were working at the skate shop playing in bands and then you took a pretty big blind leap of faith and quit to go on tour. Yeah. And I think that that is such a pivotal moment and I'm curious your thoughts because in some ways you were doing it by like having a job, being able to play music and then something in you made you quit that all to go sell merch instead of playing. And that's when everything like really started going. Yeah. Yeah. So like what, like, let's talk about that moment because that's such a huge pivotal moment. Do you think that it has to be, do you think somebody who's listening to this and interested in going full-time tour, like, do you think you need that moment, that full leap of faith moment of getting out of the hometown scene and just fucking getting on any random tour doing any position or like that's just such an important part of that what do you think yeah man i mean i think there's definitely different ways to go about it but that is one of the ways that like if you really put your head towards something like 
it'll happen. You know what I mean? It'll work out if you truly mm-hmm. just grind and, and like throw all your eggs in one basket. I, I really do. Especially if it's like something you're directly passionate. About. Like we said earlier, it's really though, if you just put your eggs in one basket, like you're bound to like have a nice omelet somewhere along the line. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's my cliche. I just made up, but like, yeah, I mean like, yo, I fuck with that. It's funny. I mean, I, I now over the years i've met so many people that like have never done the van tours have never like put eight people in a hotel room and stuff like that and i'm like cool good on you but like you missed a hell of an experience and like for me it was it was never about like making a shit ton of money it really wasn't until i realized that like i could make money off of it and i was like oh like this could be a sustainable lifestyle for me if i continue to like progress and do this as well as i'm supposedly doing it you know this can be a career yeah. It wasn't until then yeah. that I was like, holy shit, like, this is my career. But yeah, I mean, I, I think at some point you do have to just like dive in, dude. Like it's it's with anything. You just have to commit to those 10,000 hours of mastery at some point. You really, it, it's just a commitment thing. That's really all it is. I so heavily agree with that. And that's, it's just cool. Like, I think that in the beginning of that commitment, it's fucking scary because Yo, you're dude. at, hour, you're at hour zero or I don't know, yeah. hour a hundred. Yeah. And you're like, oh, fuck, like, am I doing this? But if you don't do that, if you don't quit that job and just go all in on that thing, I think that there's a world where you get stuck in that limbo of kind of doing. That yeah, thing. that's very true. That That is very true. I think for me, it was just like, it was always a dream. You know what I mean? So like, I mean, the first tour was so exciting. This, all the tours, they're still yeah. exciting. But like, I just like, I'll look back at pictures from that very first tour and I just see like the childish like happiness like of like holy shit yeah. I'm out here in Utah <laughs> like look at this yeah. crazy world you know and yeah. it's just like it's just it's something that I would never trade dude it's I would I would never like give that back for any amount of money for any amount of like stability or whatever like it's I I was broke for a long ass time but like not really that broke anymore and like i've been around the world you know before the age of but 30 you said it stuff, dude. so it's it's not money like yeah cool that's great that you can make that a viable thing but it's like it's the people and the experiences and i hear that yeah. in your voice and i hear that in your story is like <laughs> it didn't start as like here's the blueprint to get fucking paid it was just yeah. like i get to go to all these places with my friends mm-hmm. and like do this cool shit yeah. like it comes from a very genuine place. I was just like eager to learn too you know because I had done like the local band stuff for so long and felt like that I was felt like I was like making good waves with my our project in you know Metro Detroit and like it was cool to like have that platform and do that whole thing which you know was a dream I was like playing little punk gigs and house shows and like people liked our band And then I was just like, how do I get my band to the next level? Or how do I get me at least to the next level? Like, I see there is bigger things that I could do. And I'm going to doing that. I just want to get closer and closer to the sun and hope I don't go fucking blind. Right. But like, um, (laughs) yeah, I just, you know, it's crazy. It it is a crazy thing to look back on it and now just be like, oh, yeah, I just finished an arena tour where we not we, you know, we were direct support for Dan and Shay, but like sold almost half a million tickets. You know, like it's like that's yeah. fucking nuts. yeah, that's real, that's fucking real. Literally that's far, far from people. local bands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you think in that transition? Like, as you look at it now, and as like at one point you were on that side of being in the local band on the outside looking in, what were some of the lessons that you learned, or some like, are there certain moments or pivotal experiences or lessons that you learned? that now you look back on and like aha moments of leveling up. Like, did you have any of those, like your first tours where you're like, holy shit, like if only I had known this, or maybe that's too vague of a question. Right? Um, No, not really. It's not a vague question by any means. There are definitely things that I have like adapted to and understood of like, oh, this is a great way to get things done, you know? Um, and I think a lot of them come more from just, just the, the fact of like being driven but that guy who I did merch with, Evan Myers, the very first, you know, he used to manage Joe Hurtler and the Rainbow Seekers. Now he's out with um, Hippocampus, but he's who I like learned a bunch of stuff from. And he used to always say, just fucking work hard, be nice. And like, 
I think mm-hmm. in the touring world, that is such an underlying thing. I think there is a lot of like dick swinging and like old head hierarchy shit that kind of goes through that industry. But I yeah. feel like yeah. the, the, the like more modern aspect is like, yo, we're all in this together. And like, there's no reason to be a dick, you know? And unfortunately from the business side of things, maybe you have to be a dick to get that deal done or whatever. But in, in reality, like there are ways to get those deals done and ways to like get the job done for that matter by just like fucking gritting your teeth and s- smiling and like being a good person. You know, nobody wants to work with a dickhead. Right. So that yeah, was, that's definitely dude. one. And then the other one is just like kind of still result revolves around that exact same situation um, of just like doing the things that need to be done. Right. Of just like, if you see that trash is full, like just take it out, you know, don't ask questions. Don't ask whose it is. Mm-hmm. Don't ask why to a certain extent. I, I, I look at yeah. that now and I'm like, yo, I'm not cleaning up after you kids anymore. But like, but right. one of those things but where it's like, if you see somebody struggling, you help that person. Right. And like, that's yeah. kind of what it is. And it's like, you know, as a tour manager, I now like, I understand a great bit of lighting because I've had to help my LD so much. I understand way more about audio yeah. than I ever thought I would, because I'm not, not only do I have to, but it's just like, you know, when I see my crew needing help, I step in. And it's just like, you do the things yeah. that need to get done to get the job done and make everything easier for everyone. And it's just like that yeah. whole collective consciousness of just like, again, we're all in this together. I, I love, like you just said that so well. And it's like, those are very, very simple principles. Mm-hmm. And I could imagine somebody listening to this who maybe hasn't gone out on that proper tour yet. And they feel like they're in that local thing. And it's like, wait, so all I have to do is be nice and it'll get better. And it's like, no, 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 it's not <laughs> quite that. But like, I think that it is this extremely simple principle of no matter how far in a career you get, just having the work ethic of not being above shit and just treating people like people and always doing what it takes to get X project done, that never, ever goes away. And it is like oddly funny how simple that is and how much that really communicates to anyone at any level. Yeah, for sure. Another thing I was saying, Diana, my producer and editor, mm-hmm. she's like just now starting to tour okay. and like van days. And we were talking about like, I think in those days, it's really easy for it to feel like it's not a job and nobody's working and everyone's just like dicking around and like, I don't know, drinking in a van or like doing like whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think that those days are really important days to differentiate and like not get caught up in the distractions. Yeah. Like it can feel so amateur and it can feel just like chaotic yeah. and really easy to be like, oh, well, if no one else is working, I don't have to work. But if you're at that level and you don't get distracted by those things and you keep your head down and focus and like if you're out on the road to take photos or shoot video, like when everybody else is like partying or something like that and you're editing, that translates sure. and then you transcend and like you go to that next level where other people can get stuck in that. Yeah, that is a definite. It's like if somebody's paying you to do a job, you better do that job for sure. Yeah. Um, Cuz I think that's a thing that like if you're not if if you're not familiar with tour, like the the fun of it, you can get lost in the fun of it and forget that there are jobs to be done. Yeah. And that's like, I think, especially on the crew side, the people that don't last are the ones that want to live the fun life, but then kind of put the work life on the back half. Yeah. And, and there is, I, I agree 100%, but I also think that like, there has to be a balance, dude. Like if you're yeah. in a band and it's like, you're out here doing 30 shows in 37 days across the country, like that's not fun, dude. Did you sign up to do that? Like, that's not fun at all. That's not healthy is what it is. It's not healthy. It's not a sustainable way to tour. And it's like, I think one thing to remember is like to balance it. And like, remember that this can be fun and like, make it fun. Like you can, you can get paid to have fun, right? Like you hire booking agents and you hire managers to work for you. You know what I mean? And it's like, whoa, which is like, it's a thing that like, once I started getting into this Camino stuff and like, finally getting onto buses and stuff like that. And like realizing how much nicer it is to sleep at night. And like, I'm like, God, man, like this is awesome. We don't have to drive. I specifically don't have to drive eight hours or, you know, 60 hours every week, whatever it might be. And it's just like, I feel like they're just like, 
a, a way to make touring like sustainable and and mentally healthy is so necessary and like yeah. I get it. Like you can't pay your whole crew to have multiple days off a week, but at the same time, it's like, know that like rest and like slowing down is like a necessary thing to like get the job done. Right. It's like, it's, it's a wow. necessary thing. And I learned that after a couple of years, not that I was like burning myself out and partying every night. Like I had my fair share of fun, but I also realized that I was like, dude, I can't drink like four beers a night, every night. Like, fuck that, man. I'm getting fat, you know, yeah. <laughs> like I'm breaking out. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. But it's just something to dude, remember that I, like, you just yeah. like, like the, the huge word is sustainability and it's, it's a buzzword. It can be used in so many different facets, but you just have to think of the longevity of like what your intention and what your goal is. And like health is a big one that, that just like, route a tour that like maybe don't do a full us do two halves you know what i mean like make it so that it is yeah. a little bit easier and you're not driving through the, an oklahoma snowstorm i hear a lot of like pandeterminism in what you're saying is like you 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 kind of actually like checked my point and balanced it out very well where it's like do the job, do the work, but also don't kill yourself mm -hmm. and be a good hang and have fun and like yeah. keep it loose because if you take it too seriously, then you're the person that takes it too seriously and burns out yeah. and over routes and overworks. Yeah, so like exactly. I think that there's a lot of validity in what you said and I, I think you you expressed that well. <laughs> so here you are. You're very clearly leveled up. You're at this spot where you're doing arena tours. I loosely know Band Camino. I know Jameson more and Johnny more, but yeah. Really, really respect these dudes. Feel like they're such a hardworking, rad band, yeah. making great music. They've got to be an, an extremely fun group to tour with. <laughs> so now, like at this spot, like uh, take a second. Like I want to hear you reflect. Like, what's some of the most fun moments you've had now, or like some experiences, or like at this level, like what stands out? Because you were for so long on this outside looking in, and like here you are. So like, where are you? Like, fuck yeah, we just did that. Yeah, dude. Honestly, I kind of got chills just thinking about it, truthfully. But like, the this is another like tearjerker kind of story. Like, uh, this this was like the moment where I was like, "Holy shit, dude!" Like, "Holy shit!" Was um, we when I when I first like stopped when I first decided I wasn't going to go to Cairo school, and I told my dad, and they're like, "Well, you better have a plan." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, sure." I, I got, I got a plan. Don't worry about it. <laughs> plan. And yes. My, that. my, uh, my middle brother, I honestly, I think it was both my brothers. We were in like a group chat or whatever, but <clears throat> they were just like, all right, man, do you, but like it's arenas or bust, you know that. Right. And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> so like, that was the, that was literally the first goal. Like the first goal was like, I'll know I've made it somewhere once I've done arenas and lo and yeah. behold, the first show of the dan and shay arena tour was march 6th 2020 which is my brother's birthday so dude so i'm like you know the first note of the first song comes in and i'm like standing side stage just like sobbing facetiming my brother on his birthday and i was like bro we made it bro we did it like it was just like one of those moments where i was like fuck dude like where it was like one of the most visceral like accomplishments that i've ever had in my entire life and so like that was a big one but as far as just like good memories dude just like honestly it's like the struggles become the more fun memories that you think of and and stuff like that like we have copious amounts of good times you know what i mean like whether it's like going to freaking discotheques in amsterdam like until seven in the morning or crazy like that as i talk about being healthy um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but dude it was like i think a big step was once i did get into like doing the bus stuff because i had never been on a bus until our first headliner when i had to manage one so i just like wow yeah i just stepped on a bus and i was like all right i gotta make sure this thing makes makes it around the country and like dude there are times where like we almost had the bus towed in toronto and here i am like talking to a toronto tow truck person like you you really don't have to do this like just just don't do it and like the club owner is trying to like pay off the cop and like that kind of shit and like just just things like that and dude there's another crazy story where it's, it's kind of a long one but i'll try and i'll it. try and i'll it. try and consolidate it this is 
Thanksgiving 2019. Uh, and we got this offer to open for 1975 um, in, wow. in Grand Prairie, Texas. So it would have been the lot, which it. is like a what, like seven and a half thousand caps, something like that. So arguably mm. the biggest show we've ever fucking done. And, you know, arguably a band that is, you know, it was formative to like who the band Camino is. All of, they all loved 1975 in their early years and still do. And so we're like, holy shit. Like this is, that was one for them. We're like, holy shit, we're fucking doing it. So we're on our way to Grand Prairie, Texas, whatever. It's like a 10 or 11 hour drive or something stupid like that. I don't remember. It's a long drive. Yep. And our bus breaks down like somewhere between Memphis and Little Rock. So we're like five and a half, six hours from Nashville. And we are still another like six hours from the greater Dallas area. And it's the day before Thanksgiving, I believe. And it's like three in the morning, four in the morning. I wake up at like four in the morning, Perfect. like we're pulled over on the side of the highway. And our bus driver is like, well, this thing ain't starting. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like, all right. So we call our depot and they're like, let's try and let's try and get you a mechanic. And we're like, dog, it's 4 a.m. And we're an hour from the biggest major city. Uh, it's the day before giving. So nothing is fucking open. And I'm like, all right, let's try and like figure out if we can like rent a 12 passenger van. There's no rental companies within 45 minutes. It's five again, it's 5 a.m. now and like nobody is answering. But at this point, you know, our manager J Jameson is up and um, we're, we're like on the phone with AEG at this point and like talking to the, the uh, TM for 1975 and we're like, yo, we might have to bail on this. Like, we don't know what's going to happen. So whatever, 6 a.m. rolls around. And um, at this point, they're, the night train, I, I don't know if I'm allowed, allowed to drop the name, but like our depot, our bus company is like, we're going to send a repair unit from Nashville to you. So we're like, all right, cool. They'll be here, what, at like 2 p.m.? We're supposed to load in at one and we still have six hour drive. So without all of the technicalities and, and, and specs of the situation, basically we're like, AEG is like to the point where like, we'll get you a, we'll charter a private jet for you to get here. Like you have to get here. We'll rent an entire back line. And I'm like, we can't do the show without our, I mean, we could do it without our back line, but like, we need our rack. We need our ears. We need all that shit. You know what I mean? Somewhere around like, nine and like 11 a.m i want to say it is um a, a star coach a bus is coming by and it pulls over and it wasn't a night train bus but it turned out that bus driver knew our bus driver and our bus driver still had valid insurance with that busing company and so we're like connecting the dots and we're like can we put our trailer on your bus and you drive us and we make it happen like this, this bus driver and this <laughs> dude, it's crazy. It's mad. Um, it's John Cleese, the uh, Holy Grail dude, um, the comedian, the old, the old English comedian dude. Um, and it's a star coach. So there's like a big bed in the back and like six condos up front or three condos up front or whatever it is. And we're literally sitting like ass, ass, knees to knees in the front. Like we're just like laying in the, in the aisle because there's no room on this bus. And so it goes from what was supposed to be like an 11 a.m. arrival, 1 p.m. load in, 5 p.m. sound check, 7 o'clock doors thing. They push doors an hour. We get there and we set the stage in 35, less than 30 minutes, like 30 minutes. Like, I don't want to bend the truth, but legitimately, it was the fastest load out or yeah, load in, unpack, set stage, line check I've ever seen, ever done, ever will do like. We show up at seven or something like that, and we rip at seven twenty-five type shit, and then we just rip a bitch and set and and uh, and happy Thanksgiving like that. That's a story that will. I don't know if it'll ever be topped. You know what I mean? Like we Dude. literally stopped traffic on a major highway the day before Thanksgiving, pushed our dead bus by hand down the shoulder, let this other bus back up in the right lane, back into place hook up the trailer and then drive six hours. Yo, <laughs> if you ever need to explain what being a tour manager is, it's that that Dog. story 
is what being a tour manager is. Yeah, man. And like, oh my fucking god, yeah, dude. It was. That's it. That's the one. That is, that is one of them. Yeah, dude. Right. Like, because certain days it's just show up and where's the green room? And then yeah. other days it's how the fuck is this going to happen? And it's connecting all those pieces and getting everybody on board to make crazy fucking ideas like that work. Yeah. And dude, I was in that. Like, I, I think anybody who's toured can spiritually relate to a story like that. I'm sweating thinking but, about it, honestly, man. Maybe, dude. maybe, maybe it's the Cortado <laughs> that I've had, but like, oh man, that was one of the craziest moments because we truly were just like, we're fucked. Like Janice and I were like, yep. we are so fucked. And then yep. this bus driver just like pulls over and they're there for like 45 minutes to an hour before we're like, can you just drive us? And he was like, well, I reckon we'll have to call and see, but I reckon we could probably do something like that. And I'm like, let's go. You know what I mean? Let's like, go, <laughs> dude. But also like you said it, it's like, even at this level now that you have this success, there's plenty of fun times and things to celebrate and reminisce on, but it is kind of sometimes those struggles and those crazy stories that you look back on the fondest because yeah. it's like, what, what a unique life and what unique challenges, like that's a fun game to play. Yeah, man. And I think that like that, if I ever needed to know if you were a real one, the fact that you reflect on that now <laughs> fondly is maybe the wrong word to use, but like that, that story comes to mind. It's like, that's fucking it yeah, dude. dude that's it it was it was definitely an experience and like i pray that i never have another like bus situation that bad. then again we're on our way to day one of the dan and shay tour this year for a rehearsal in where was it somewhere in like the carolinas and our bus broke down like just outside of chattanooga we were like three hours from nashville and we lost a tie like the, like the lug nuts just like ripped off of our trailer and like it was the gnarliest flat tire i've ever seen and same kind of vibe we were like are we gonna have to rent a box truck like how are we gonna do this but lo and behold what happened was they just sent out a mechanic this dude like replaced our rotor literally replaced like our brake and rotor and whole yeah hub, like the full axle the whole yeah. thing in a truck stop parking lot and we showed up to rehearsal seven hours later whatever <laughs> Dude, it's crazy. Yeah, man. It's so crazy. But I think necessity gets you there too. Like these are things that you can't plan no. and you could never figure out no. how they're going to work. But it's like if you can dance with that unknown and that chaos yeah. and just make creativity and necessity get you through it, like that's that's so much of what it is. Yeah, it Another piece that I wanted to ask you about, uh, which is more about yourself, but I'm actually really interested in it because I think that this is a model now that the smart ones are uh, doing. And I think you have to be passionate about it. But not only do you have a very rad career as Band Camino's tour manager, but you did start a brand of your own. And you said that so loose or like humbly in the beginning. <laughs> but I actually really want to talk about that because I think that figuring out little things like that um, not only represent a little bit more income, but it also represents an entrepreneurial spirit that I think carries on with people and is a great way to think about all of life. And so I'm curious of like what your inspiration was to start that. And it's, it's, it's very well executed. That was something that I noticed right off the bat thank was you, I was man. like, fuck, this is cool. Thank you. Thank you. So like, where did that come from? And like, how, how do you do all the designs and like, t tell me about that. I'm genuinely interested. Yeah. Um, so without going too far back, just have always loved i've always had like a passion for streetwear thing and style for the overarching term i guess we can just say and um it was another thing that was like man it'd be really cool to like have a clothing line one day or something like that and whatever and um once pandemic hit um my mentor uh irving ronk who manages uh Joe Hurtler and the Rainbow Seekers. He's always had this like yeah. merchandising company, whether it was just like sourcing vendors for festivals or, or uh, facilitating printing, manufacturing, all that kind of stuff. Um, he had kind of dove in into the Shopify e-commerce stuff in like 2017, 2016 or whatever. And yeah, once pandemic hit, he hit me up and he was like, hey man, like, do you need some extra work? And I was like, absolutely. And so he's like, I have this Meek Mill account. Do you want to help manage Meek Mill's web store? And I was like, yeah wow. let's fucking do it let's let's do it so yeah i was doing that and um we jumped into uh, i was able to work on like megan the stallion store and a few other like kind of high profile clients or whatever 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 and in doing that i just kind of like had my own division in there where i was just starting to like 
bring in more independent acts and source different graphic designers and all this kind of stuff. And I just basically learned the ins and outs of, of, of like global merchandising for lack of better terms, yeah. but I, that's yeah. exactly what it is. Kind of just started like diving into learning about different blanks and just kind of seeing what my favorite t-shirt was in the world and shit like that. And, um, I came across this one designer. Uh, well, first I came across this brand. I, I came across this, this textile brand called Everybody World, which is a division that came from the split of American Apparel. So American Apparel, you know, mm. went out and it turned into Los Angeles Apparel and it came into Everybody yeah. World. And Everybody World is basically the recycle, recyclable, sustainable version of LA Apparel, like similar cuts, similar, you know, similar fabrics, wow. all made under the same house. Basically, basically the alumni yeah. from American split into those two and they make the same thing. One is recycled cotton, one is not. I found this company and I was like trying to pitch it to like so many artists and they're like, oh no, the overhead's not good enough. Like we don't want $10 t-shirts, $14, whatever, whatever. And I was like, all right, well, like if, if y'all aren't going to use it, I will, you know? And so I was Yo. like, let me find something to put on this, this shirt. And what's cool about them is everybody world does retail, they do wholesale, but they also have this thing like maybe like quarterly, they'll do a factory flea market where they sell a bunch of yeah. like overstock, imperfect stock, just random stuff. And I was like, I'm, I'm a very like uh, visceral person that's like, sure, I could like you, anybody can start a brand if they open a web browser. You know what I mean? But for me, right. I was yeah, like, facts. I can't like, put coffee in this cup unless the cup is right in front of me you know what i mean so i was like sure. let me order these random shirts and then i'll go from there and i was like all right this mm -hmm. is the color of the shirt that i have the design has to fit this color and um mm. to answer yeah kind of more direct one of your questions is i basically started scrolling through this rolodex of designers that i had used for other artists over the years and came across this girl um ann escamilla from chicago which is from michigan lives in chicago now and I'd done a client's piece with her and like the process of working with her was just like really awesome. And I loved her work. And it was one of those things where I just kind of wanted, I, I, I knew, I knew a bunch of friends that had started doing just like artisan craft work over pandemic. And I was yeah. like, I now understand how to do this e-commerce, this business side of things. I, I am creative myself, but like, I don't want to spend 10,000 hours learning how to do leather work. I don't want to spend 10,000 hours trying to like get better at graphic design when I know people that are yeah. doing exactly what yeah. I want and what I Fuck, like. That's good. Yeah. And so I was just like, that's a great point of like executive thinking too, yeah. is like knowing your, your wheelhouse and what you are a master at yeah. and then finding and delegating the masters at other things. Yeah. And that, yeah, I mean, dude, that's exactly, that's exactly all it was, man. I just like, I was like, hey, I want to like start this online gallery of sorts. I have this like kind of this model where like essentially I just wanted to implement a better sense of royalties per se yeah. um, to graphic designers because there's very few graphic oh, cool. designers or artists necessarily that get the benefit of how big a product can be, right? And so, oh, fuck, that's so true. It's always a flat rate. Yeah, you know what I mean? So I was like, yo, like, let's work on, I, I, I hit up Ann and I was like, yo, let's work on like a batch of clothes. I'll give you like a small flat rate up front, but I will split the net with you 50 50. I'll handle all the back end. Whoa. I'll handle everything. I'll handle all of the manufacturing. I will handle all of the financing. Like, I just want you to help me come up with this product, you know, these products. Wow. And, um, yeah, that's, 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 that's really how it started is like, you know, I would, I have like this list, this running note in my phone of just like random crazy ideas. And I'm like, I wonder if I can do that. You know, I wonder if I can get that done. I wonder if we could make something like this or these weird graphics. That I was like, I wonder if somebody can like get this idea out of my brain and put it on something. Right. Yeah. And so, um, it's been really cool. I've done, I don't know, like four or five drops at this point and yeah, it's just kind of a thing where like, you know, I'll start a, a a a file, a PSD file and put some slop on a thing and send it to somebody and they'll rework it. They'll send it back. I'll tweak it and send it back and shit like that. Or I, I've done like a leather drop with um, this kid, Ryan Hoger, who's the guitarist for DeHertland and the Rainbow Seekers. He started doing leather work over cool. pandemic and we did like a wallet, a, a keychain, and like a, a little like desk caddy thing and just kind of things where I was like, 
little like essential but functional and as sustainable as possible items was really the goal because you know growing up not growing up but like you know as a young adult working in retail it was like i had this crazy like knowing of fast fashion and yes. now like kind of being you know also having like this streetwear mindset i i now i'm like familiar with high fashion and i was like yo fuck yeah. both of those things like yeah Nobody should <laughs> yeah. pay a thousand dollars for a t-shirt, but also nobody should print like 60,000 brand new t-shirts just to like make a bunch of money. And I feel like kind of yeah. like the mid ground of that could be sustainable fashion where it's like you're using recycled cotton and it's good for the earth and you're splitting, you know, your profits with the designer. You're, you're paying people that helped. You know, not just like yeah. scooting by. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, imagine if the graphic designer for fucking Garth Brooks like got royalties on every T-shirt that motherfucker sold. You know, like he wouldn't right. have to do anything for yeah. the rest of his life. But instead, Garth Brooks merch manager and Garth Brooks man manager and Garth Brooks are making millions of dollars off this merch. And who knows? Maybe that graphic T-shirt designer is still living in a web one bedroom apartment or something like that. You know what I mean? Dude, no facts. Yeah, so, that's, I mean, like you said that to me, and I was just like, holy fuck, like. It really is like it's such the model that I didn't even think about it. And like that is kind of fucked. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. these artists get paid. And like the flat fees uh, aren't even that crazy at times. It's like one hundred to a thousand dollars typically right. for a merch design. And it's like so it's not even like you're like enough to like cash out. Yeah. I just was trying to like I, I don't know, like I truly don't know enough about like in my opinion, I, I could always learn more about the the true business side of contracts and stuff, all that and music industry and royalties and all of that kind of shit. But I just know it's fucked, right? You know, like mm -hmm. yeah, I live in Nashville where like songwriters are struggling to get by and, and, and the pendulum has shifted slightly over the years yes. to where people are getting, you know, more of what they're worth for their product. But I think I just like have always kind of had that headspace of just like, yo, man. Like, I hope everyone is getting what they're worth and getting paid for the work they've been doing. Um, yeah. It was also just a passion project Bro. for me, dude, where I was just yeah. like, I had the time, I found, I had the resources and I was like, let's try it. You know, like, what else am I doing? Like, why not try and put some stuff and sell it and just try? I fuck with that <laughs> so heavily. I had no idea. Like, I legit just saw it. I was like, oh, this looks cool. I had no idea that there was that much thought put into it. And <laughs> I really love that ethos behind it. Like, that's really fucking cool. Thanks, man. I also, like, wasn't trying to make it be anything bigger than what it is, too. You know, like, um, anybody could find some capital to start a clothing company and make it big or make it look really good. I just, like, you know, it was the middle of pandemic and I've had all is well tattooed on my body for like years and years. And I was trying to find out like what I wanted the brand to be called. And I was like, well, I just, let's just call it the all is well mm. shop. You know what I mean? And yeah, like, yeah exactly. Further, yeah. You know, it's just like, <laughs> let's just call it that. And like, I'm sure people could use a positive message that is also kind of cryptic and like, I, I don't know. It's just like, just having fun, yeah. dude. Truly just like, just having fun and trying to like work on just doing projects with my pals. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like I, that's kind of like a through line in your story, huh? Is like quickly in your life, you were like, you know, like, let's not do the blueprint. Let's not follow just the, the copy paste path. Like let's do the fun, passionate thing. And it seems like that as your compass has taken you pretty fucking far, huh? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm hearing. I respect the hell out of Thanks, it. And it's, it's really cool too. Like when doing this podcast, I literally just blindly trusted Nick. I mean, shout out Nick. Like he's the fucking dude. And at this point, anybody that he says is good people is good yeah, people. Dude. But like, it's so uh, encouraging to have conversations like this with people that I'm just now meeting and be like, oh, cool. There's still hope. Like yeah. there's still people that are out here doing it for the right reasons. And like, this is that message. And this is that thing of like, I really don't want to say that I got jaded by the music industry, but I think that the years in the game and seeing that not everyone had the right motives and intentions. And Seriously. some people really did just look at it of like, how can I capitalize on this? And how is this a check? And mm -hmm. how can I get the most from it? So talking to people like yourself that followed passion and got this far is like, 
everything that I want to hear and talk about. Oh, yeah, and man. it's such a cool example to set. So fucking thank you for being so real. <laughs> you know? Dude, I appreciate it. You seem the same way, man. I like, we'll have to take some time and uh, I'd love to hear more about your story sometime too. So absolutely. absolutely. Next time we're in the same city together, it's fucking on. No doubt. Where can everybody find you? What's like the best way for everyone to keep up with you, to check out what you're up to, all that good stuff? Yeah. Uh, Instagram is is most definitely the easiest public platform that I use. My Instagram handle is Brad Brains. Uh, so it's at underscore Brad underscore Brains. I also, yeah, run the All Is Well shop. And so that has an Instagram that is the dot all is well dot shop um, or the all is well shop dot com if you want to go go see what some of the product looks like. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. I love that. Well, dude, thank you so, so much for doing yeah, this. Yeah, man, Andrew, it was a pleasure. So there you have it, Brad's episode. I really hope you liked that one. I, I get the best feeling when I meet people for the first time and we have conversations that natural and reaffirming that there's people in it doing it for all the right reasons and with such rad outlooks and stories. So I hope you took something positive away from this episode. And if you did and you love the show and you want even more from him, there is a Patreon, patreon.com slash where are all my friends. And we did a little bonus episode as well, where we talk about like favorite media. So like favorite book, favorite album or band, favorite show, favorite skate part in a video, um, little behind the scenes stuff like that. So that bonus episode is on the Patreon right now. And if you like this episode and you want to share it on socials, that's massively helpful and always appreciated. And like I said in the intro, if you're listening to this right when it dropped, we're doing a giveaway with All Is Well. So if you share it and follow the brand, we're gonna give some clothing away as well, which is awesome. And if you wanna do me a favor and leave five stars on the Spotify app, if you're listening there, I appreciate that. It's a new feature they did. I don't wanna ramble too much. Thank you for listening. I'll be back next week with another episode. Later. <laughs>